All right, y'all. Remain standing for your boy. Let's get it. Remain standing for me. We're going to read God's word together. Remain standing for me. Thank you. Bless the Lord. We want to honor him. This is a posture for us honoring God's authority through his word. We are rendering ourselves saying, God, your word that's going to be preached, apply it to my life. And so that's what we're going to continue to do, at least as the spirit leads when I'm preaching. With that being said, we're in James chapter three. We're going to finish that today. And it's going to talk about wisdoms, wisdoms. Let's read together. Verse 13. If you are wise and understand God's ways, prove it by living an honorable life, doing good works with the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you are bitterly jealous and there is selfish ambition in your heart, don't cover up the truth with boasting and lying. For jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom. Such things are earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there is every disorder and evil of every kind. But the wisdom from above is pure. It is also peace-loving, gentle at all times, and willing to yield to others. It is full of mercy and the fruit of good deeds. It shows no favoritism and is always sincere. Godly wisdom versus worldly wisdom. The direction of our lives have to do with which one we're listening to. That'll be today's message. Let's pray. Jesus, immerse your people with wisdom. But you gotta get a whole bunch of crap out of there beforehand. Soften our hearts. Make us willing today to submit to you. You have so much more for this church. You have so much more for this house. You have so much more for our households independently. We want you. Holy Spirit, you have access in this place. Use me as a vessel and a mouthpiece of yours that you would say what you want me to say. Nothing more and nothing less. Fill me in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and take a seat, y'all. Go ahead and take a seat. Decisions. Decisions. Decisions, our life, full of them, from insignificant things like the color we wore today or the outfit we wore, and on the other side of the spectrum, significant decisions like whom we're going to date, who we're going to marry, whether we're going to let go of bitterness or not, whether we recognize this or not. Every decision, especially as we link them up behind one another, accumulatively, we have to recognize that it will influence our legacies, our reputations, and the condition of our souls. Our decision to obey God or to not obey God will determine the levels of favor and anointing that we walk in or that we don't walk in. We don't have to look any further than our actual Bibles to see the significance of decisions. We are still talking about bad decisions that were made biblically. I'm talking about when Jesus betrayed, or sorry, Judas betrayed Jesus. Lord, thank you for catching that one for me. (laughs) We're still talking about Adam and Eve disobeying God in the Garden of Eden. And we're still on the flip side of those things, we're talking about good decisions. We're still talking about how Esther went before the king, risked her life to save God's people. Amen? We're still talking about Jesus submitting his will when he didn't want to go to Calvary to die for our sins, submitted it to God that then propelled him and put into motion him sacrificing his life for our sins. Our decisions have already and will determine the course of our lives. And the destination that we get to will be determined on who we're listening to. Wisdom or not. See, James in this text 
today actually categorizes two types of wisdom. He says that there's godly wisdom, which is true wisdom from our creator who knows all of the way he designed everything. He's objective truth. He dictates what's a truth and what's a lie. And he says, this is wisdom, godly wisdom. And then there's a wisdom that's not wise at all. That is worldly wisdom. And the destination of our lives are going to be determined on where we pull our decisions from. Will they be influenced by worldly wisdom or will they be influenced by godly wisdom? Another way to actually say this is who are we listening to? You see, James, the writer of this book, was heavily influenced by the book of Proverbs because of his Jewish traditions. And in it, Solomon, the writer of Proverbs, he actually describes godly wisdom as a person, specifically a woman. Look with me, Proverbs 3. Blessed are those who find wisdom, those who gain understanding, for she is more profitable than silver, yields more better returns than gold. She is more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand. In her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are pleasant ways and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who take hold of her. Those who hold her fast will be blessed. Befriending Lady Wisdom, consulting her on a decision will bring blessing and benefit to our lives. On the flip side, befriending the mistress of wisdom, which is worldly wisdom, asking consultants of her on decision-making, that will inhibit the blessing that we experience and the favor that we walk in. The reality is that we tend to make decisions without considering whether it's godly wisdom or whether it's worldly wisdom. So we're going to get into this text today. James is going to describe to us the blessing and benefit of godly wisdom. And by God's grace, he's going to stir our hearts to consider what decisions we are making. And then he's going to teach us about worldly wisdom. And by God's grace, we'll have a distaste for those things. And he will bring a greater awareness that every decision we make is sourced out of those two things. What type of church will we be? It's up to us. Let's get into the text. Chapter 3, verse 13. If you are wise and understand God's ways, prove it by living an honorable life, doing good works with the humility that comes from wisdom. Look at the words in this text, wise and understand. They're a part of how we process things to get to a decision. Uh, Proverbs 2, Solomon actually says this in verse 6. For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth, come knowledge and understanding. Wisdom, knowledge, understanding. In the decision-making process, we use all three of those things. Knowledge is the accumulation of information. It's you gathering, us gathering information. Understanding is the interpretation of it. And then wisdom is the application of that. We first get knowledge then we get understanding, and then we make wise decisions. Now, whether they are godly wisdom or worldly wisdom depends on the interpretation of the information and where we're sourcing everything. So, for example, when uh, Danny and I last winter were deciding, should we put our kids in their first youth sports? We looked into wrestling. We got all of the information the time and the financial costs. And that was knowledge. We were gathering information. Then we took that and didn't just sign them up, but we thoroughly thought through examining whether we should enroll them or not. A part of that in the process was we really felt led to say, okay, with all this information, will this pull away from our marriage? Is this worth actually putting this type of investment time-wise 
or a strain on our family at this age for this sport. Okay, that is understanding. Then we chose to actually enroll them based on the information that we gathered. That is wisdom. Now, whether it was godly wisdom or worldly wisdom is actually us for us to discern here today even as we examine that example from my life. The key to actually knowing those things is to continue in this passage. So we're going to reread verse 13 to look more into the characteristics of godly wisdom. We'll go back. If you are wise and understand God's ways, prove it by living an honorable life, doing good works with humility that comes from wisdom. Godly wisdom chooses to honor God. It makes decisions that honor God. If there's a decision between God honoring versus God dishonoring, she chooses God honoring. If there's a decision between God honoring and God being more honored, she chooses the second because it honors God most. Why is that? Because lady wisdom, godly wisdom, cares about our motives. They actually matter to her. James tells us that she doesn't just do good works, but she does them with humility. She tells us to do certain things, not out of recognition, because God our Father sees us, recognizes us, and will reward us, sometimes now, but especially in the next life. That is is godly wisdom running through our heads. And that's not all. James actually is going to describe more qualities of godly wisdom. But before we get there, in his writing, he's going to transition and make a hard right turn to talk about worldly wisdom. And we're going to see, y'all, it operates with a totally different value system. Let's go. 14, 15. If you are wise and understand God's ways, prove it by living an honorable life, doing good works with the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you are bitterly jealous and there is selfish ambition in your heart, don't cover up the truth with boasting and lying. For jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom. Such things are earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there we will find disorder and evil of every kind. Worldly wisdom is definitely not God's kind of wisdom. It is sourced in selfishness and jealousy. Uh, Just a quick discerner, envy is when we are Coveting what someone else has. Jealousy is being bitter over what someone else has. Coveting versus bitter. And the result of worldly wisdom is that it brings chaos. Because it's earthly, demonic, and unspiritual. We see this chaos in our workplaces. Worldly wisdom has made it normal to be selfish and jealous. In some cases, it's actually celebrated in our workplaces because it breeds competition. And competition usually brings about better results. Worldly wisdom convinces us to climb the corporate ladder using people as a rung on the way up. Worldly wisdom says it's okay to dislike your co-worker because they're getting recognized and you aren't. Worldly wisdom makes it normal to put our family, not just second, but third. Not just second, but third. To our hobbies and our work. And James calls all these things unspiritual, earthly, and demonic. Because it is self-focused. Obsessed with our will being done. And speaking of chaos, chaos brings about the hurried life. It brings about us continually working in our brains and being worn out by the multiple things 
that we have to oversee or how we got committed with certain things. Chaos and hurry, even the presence of those things are a good indicator that we may be operating in worldly wisdom. I'll say it again. If your life is chaotic and you are not rested, consider the decisions you're making because it may be coming from worldly wisdom. Who said that we had to say yes to youth sports? Who said that it's actually the best avenue to disciple our children? Who said it's the best avenue to socialize our children? Who said all those things? Who said that we had to continually sign our children up for a sport after another one ends? Although in our hearts, we hate our life. It is hurried. It's chaotic. And we're continually in this hamster wheel of chaos and restlessness in our souls. Who said it was okay to be overcommitted and sacrifice the well-being of your soul? Who said that it is okay to wake up and walk out of your door and interact with other image bearers without communing with God? Thinking unconsciously, just because the Bible says that we're blessed, that we actually operate blessed. Thinking unconsciously that we can independently operate in the spirit, covered with spiritual armor for the battles ahead without actually communing with him. Who said those things? Was that God? What is that worldly wisdom? Those are the things that we have to consider. And with worldly wisdom being unspiritual, when we're making our decisions, we must consider what the result will be in terms of our spirituality. With worldly wisdom, it will cause us to overlook the spiritual effects of our decisions. So when we commit or overcommit to certain things, we are blind or we justify us overcommitting to certain things because we overlook the spiritual condition of those around us who will be affected. Are you with me, church? We overlook how our soul is going to come out of this with the decisions that we're making. And James, by God's grace, he says that godly wisdom doesn't do that. Look with me in the text. Godly wisdom. We'll go to verse 17. But the wisdom from above is first of all pure. It's also peace-loving, gentle at all times, and willing to yield to others. It is full of mercy and the fruit of good deeds. It shows no favoritism and is always sincere. We will come across times in a day, times in a season where we're presented with the option to entertain toxic thoughts of comparison. To look at pornography. To entertain impure thoughts. To take second glances to please ourself, to go too far in ways that inflame our youthful passions. And worldly wisdom will whisper to us. She's gonna end up saying, it doesn't hurt anyone, just do it. Or your spouse, she's not giving, he's not giving up the goods, just do it. You deserve it. While godly wisdom She's going to whisper in our thoughts, consider the effects of our actions. She's going to whisper, the decisions that you make reflect your heart and you're headed towards a path of destruction. She is going to bring this amazingly beautiful biblical fear of God to us to where we don't make decisions because we don't actually want to pay the cost down the road of it being disobedience to God's best. And it's not just sexual purity either. A couple years ago, um, I was asking, Holy Spirit, how can I grow in closeness and empower, empower, closeness and empower God? I just, I wanna grow. And he put on my thought life something scary, fasting. I don't know if any of you fasted before, but I had done it once prior to that, and I love food. 
So when he put this on my mind, I thought, oh no, Lord, no, 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 no. And then you know how like, then you'll talk with someone in your friend group or you'll hear a stranger and they happen to give a word that happens to do a fast and you're like, all right, God, that's definitely from you. I'm going to surrender. So that's exactly what happened a couple of years ago. Well, I intermittent fasted for 40 days and it was supposed to end on Easter. I knew that it got to Easter and I had, God had totally changed me, filled me with more power, more desire for him, more zeal and passion to be in his presence. That was the result. He answered that fasting. But after Easter, I continued to do so because I liked what I was seeing in the mirror. Judge me if you want. Something different happens to your body when you eat less food. I'm just saying. So it was the first time that that was happening. I was looking in the mirror and I began to be really short around my family after Easter. Um, I had food, what is it called? Food hanger, hangry? Hangry, I was hangry all the time near the end of the night. And I started to realize, Roy, you need to stop because your motivation in doing fasting now has totally flipped. I was supposed to end, but I was carrying it on because of vanity. I had mixed motives now after I continued past the date that the Holy Spirit had put on my thoughts. Godly wisdom was telling me to stop because I had impure, mixed motives. And he was telling me the blessing of the fast is complete. If you're going to continue on in this, you're striving. But then that worldly wisdom was speaking to me. And she was saying, hold on. You feel way better than before you started these 40 days. You look better. Your confidence is, up, is, uh, confidence is up because you look better. Just continue. It's, you can manage all of those later times in night where you end up flipping out on the kids because they won't go to bed because you're hangry. You can handle that. Just continue in it. It was just this subtle, selfish voice that told me to continue, that justified what I was doing. That was rationalizing what I was doing. And it's not just that as we get into the text and we read, we're going to be making decisions that don't just have to do with purity, but actually has to do with peace. We've made decisions in our lives to move, to take a job or not take one, to have another child, to break up or make up, to persevere. And it was all based on reasonable things. We went with the most reasonable thing. The door was swung open. But if we were honest, there was something unsettling in our deepest, deepest desires. We didn't have what the Bible calls a peace that transcends all understanding. And we went ahead and still made the decision based off of it was reasonable looking back the decision we ended up making where we lacked peace ended up resulting in misery. And we can look back and say that was God's way of directing us with his wisdom. Church, don't go against our peace. I'll say it again, a simple phrase. Don't go against your peace. Many of us made decisions based off of money or career advancements. And then we found out later, we either got fired or we hated our jobs. Praise God for his mercy, church. His blessing will be on our repentance when we turn from those decisions, where we made them despite us not having his peace. But wouldn't it be more wise to be a church that would discern those things prior to making a decision like that and then go with our peace. There is something beautiful about avoiding unnecessary spiritual battles because we went with God's wisdom. And that's not all. We're gonna end up seeing that there's more decisions for us to consider. Look back with me. 
We're going to finish up this list that James gives us that has to do with godly wisdom. Verse 17, but the wisdom from above is first of all pure. It is also peace loving, gentle at all times and willing to yield to others. It is full of mercy and fruit of good deeds. It shows no favoritism and is always sincere. When making decisions, church, lady wisdom will make us ask a few questions. How can I deliver this with gentleness? Do I have to have my way on this matter? Can I overlook this sin? How do I not lose who I am in Christ with this decision? And then she's going to make us think specific thoughts. You can overlook that sin. It's to your and God's glory. She's going to end up whispering Don't do it because it will be interpreted by others, although it's not your motivation, by others as favoritism. Church, God cares about each and every one of our decisions. He cares about what well of wisdom that we're drinking from. He cares about which lady of wisdom we're listening to. And when we don't know what decision to make, church, All we have to do is ask, but ask with confidence. Look with me. We're jumping back to James 1, verse 5. If you need wisdom, ask our generous God, and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. Hallelujah. But when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver, for a person with divided loyalty is unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world, and they are unstable in everything they do. God wants us to ask of him more than we want to. God wants us to honor him more than we want to. God wants to bless our lives more than we want it blessed. We better believe as a church that we can go to God in confidence because he's good. He won't rebuke us for asking. He won't look down at us because we're confused in a situation. He's going to answer when we ask and ask in confidence. The only reason he will not is because we lack confidence. But praise God for his word. In Romans 8, he tells us this. The Apostle Paul writing here. If God is for us, who can be against us? Since he did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. Won't he also give us everything else? God hasn't withheld anything from us. He hasn't withheld his son. He hasn't withheld his spirit. What makes us think he'll withhold wisdom now? You with me, church? May we be a church that goes to God in confidence, genuinely asking him for his assistance. The better question for us to ask genuinely is this. Do we hunger for godly wisdom? Do we want godly wisdom? Decisions. We make them every day. Decisions. Our legacy, reputation, condition of our soul, and the anointing and favor that we live in are determined by our decisions. Will we honor God in them or will we not? Let's pray. God, I know that your church wants to honor you in their decisions. I know that your church wants to bless your name, but I also know that we're human. I'm asking that you would create a massive hunger in this church, in every leader's household right now in Jesus' name, that you would give us a hunger for godly wisdom, that we would genuinely consider the decisions we're making, that we would realize that your grace and your mercy covers all of our mistakes, but there is such wisdom in avoiding those things when we go to you first. Immerse your people, God. Do what I cannot. 
and motivate us to consider you and the cost in every decision we make. In Jesus' name, amen.